So I was trawling the depths of the archive the other day, the place where new astrophysics papers get posted, and I found a paper that I just I had to read it. Like, I didn't have a choice. The topic was just too good. It was called The Impact of AGN Outflows on the Surface Habitability of Terrestrial Planets in the Milky Way. AKA, can giant burps from the regions around supermassive black holes turn a planet like Earth from a habitable paradise to a hellscape where no life can survive? Of course I had to read it, and I figured you lot would love to as well, so I figured let's make a video on sort of another one of these like translating a scientific paper from, you know, like the language it's written in, which is for, you know, me and my astrophysics colleagues into language that everybody can understand. So the first thing we need to understand is what is one of these AGN outflows? It's sort of these giant burps of radiation and matter from the regions around a growing supermassive black hole. They obviously don't come from inside the black hole itself because nothing can travel faster than the speed of light and can escape a black hole, but it comes from the incredibly turbulent regions around a black hole. So if a supermassive black hole in the center of a galaxy can somehow have gas funneled down to it, then that gas, when it reaches the black hole, is brought into orbit around the black hole. So because the black hole is spinning, because whatever it formed from, for example, like a star or a cloud of gas, was also spinning as well, then the gas that's drawn in is going to turn from, you know, whatever sort of lumpy cloud it comes in as to a flat spinning disc, just in the same way that if you take a bowl of pizza dough and you set it spinning above your head, it flattens out into a nice disc. So if the gas does make it that far into the center of the galaxy, it's going to start orbiting the black hole in this disc, but way out from the event horizon, that point of no return where you'd have to be traveling faster than the speed of light. But gravity is still incredibly strong in those regions. So the gas in that disk gets accelerated to huge speeds. And because it's moving so fast, it's incredibly hot. And because it's incredibly hot, it starts to glow and give off radiation. It gives off light. Anything from optical light to ultraviolet light to even x-rays as well. So maybe incredibly high energy radiation. So this is what we call a growing supermassive black hole or active galactic nuclei, AGN, because eventually that gas will become part of the black hole. The black hole will grow by accreting or eating it. Kind of counterintuitively, these growing supermassive black holes are some of the brightest objects in the entire universe. They can actually outshine all the billions to trillions of stars in their galaxy. It's also what's known as a quasar. So all that light being given off by this disk of gas orbiting the black hole actually exerts a pressure outwards against anything falling in. It's something we call radiation pressure. So photons, particles of light will impact with the molecules of hydrogen in the gas that's infalling and transfer energy like balls in a game of pool. So as more and more gas falls into this disk of material around the black hole, the more radiation is then given off and the more pushback there is on the continually infalling gas until you reach a point where instead of actually joining the disk of material around the black hole, there's enough radiation pressure on the infalling gas that instead it gets turned around and flung away from the black hole in what's known as an outflow, sometimes at huge speeds, up to 10% of the speed of light. If you've got a strong enough magnetic field too, sometimes material gets funneled into these tight jets as it's flung out in a process that we can't really fully describe yet. And somehow it can then reach close to the speed of light. So there is a lot of energy in these outflows. And my own research actually looks at the impact of these outflows on the rate at which a galaxy can make new stars. So if, for, for example, you know, the energy in the outflow is just dumped into the hydrogen gas sort of reservoir in the galaxy. I'm talking about sort of, you know, quite galaxy wide now, rather than like down close to the black hole, then that gas will heat up with all that extra energy. The molecules will move faster and gravity won't be able to bring them close together so that the gas cloud collapses and makes new stars. And so with one of these outflows from a growing supermassive black hole, we think you can actually sort of like kill off a galaxy. But what this paper points out is that these outflows could also affect any planets in orbit around existing stars in a galaxy with a growing supermassive black hole too. 
But how much of an effect those outflows will have is not very well understood. So people have looked before at the impact of all that high energy radiation given off by the accretion disk, like the ultraviolet and the x-rays, especially on planet habitability. But no one's really looked at the impact of the gas outflows, the material that literally gets turned around and thrown back out again at close to like 10% of the speed of light in some cases. That's actually what's known as an ultra fast outflow or UFO, a very dangerous acronym to have in a paper about life and habitability in the galaxy. But anyway, in this study and briefing, collaborators came up with a very simple model for estimating essentially how much energy is dumped into a planet's atmosphere and therefore how much does that heat it up and therefore how many molecules of the atmosphere are then lost to space because they had enough energy to escape the pull of the gravity of that planet. And they looked at that with distance essentially from this growing super a massive black hole in the center of the galaxy, like I feel very, very close to, compared to like very, very far away. How does that affect how much energy is dumped into the atmosphere? And they did all of this assuming that the outflow that you actually get from the growing supermassive black hole is roughly spherical anyway. And to understand the results that this study finds, we need to understand the two different scenarios you can have with outflows, the two different ways that an outflow can actually sort of dump energy into the surrounding gas or, or a planet's atmosphere. So you can either have an energy-driven outflow where the energy in the outflow before and the energy in the surrounding gas after the impact is the same, we say energy has been conserved, or momentum-driven outflows where the momentum in the outflow before and the momentum in the surrounding gas after is the same. So we say the momentum has been conserved. If you're on the math, energy-driven outflows are way more efficient than momentum-driven outflows, transferring 100% of the energy from the outflow to the surrounding gas, or the planet's atmosphere, whereas a momentum-driven outflow will only transfer about 2% of the energy in the outflow, with the rest lost to, to radiation, right, to light uh, radiating away into space. The reason that we model both is because we don't actually know what scenario is actually happening in terms of outflows in galaxies, whether that's outflows from a supermassive black hole or from like a supernova sending like a shockwave through space either. We don't know which one happens. To be honest, in reality, it is probably going to be a mix of both. So you can kind of consider them as kind of like a lower and upper limit, if you will. Okay, so the first thing to look at when it comes to habitability is the temperature of an atmosphere. Do you have that perfect Goldilocks temperature that life can survive at, or is a passing outflow from a growing supermassive black hole gonna change all that? So Ambrifian collaborators modeled what would happen to an atmosphere of the same mass of the Earth if it was hit by an energy-driven outflow first shown by the magenta lines there, or a momentum-driven outflow shown by the blue lines. Now they also looked at both a nitrogen-dominated atmosphere like Earth's is today, shown by the solid lines, or a hydrogen-dominated atmosphere reminiscent of the gas giants of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, shown by the dash lines. Now this plot shows the change in temperature thing. So you can think of this as like the increase in temperature that you would get as the AGN outflow impacts a planet's atmosphere. And they look at how it changes against the distance from the center of a galaxy where the black hole is, where the outflow is strongest. So over here, you've got very close in, and over here, you've got the outskirts, like the edges of the galaxy very far away. These are logarithmic scales as well, right? So it's worth noting you go up by a factor of 10 with each step. So out at the distance of the solar system, at eight kiloparsecs, the change in temperature for a nitrogen dominated planet like Earth could be anywhere from 10 Kelvin for a momentum driven outflow to 100 Kelvin for an energy driven outflow. So an increase of 10 to 100 degrees Celsius. Remembering it's likely to be somewhere in the middle of that because you'll have a mix of momentum and energy driven outflows. Whereas if you get closer in at say one kiloparsec and the change in temperature is anywhere between 100 to 10,000 Kelvin and even higher you know, inside that radius as well to higher temperatures that are reminiscent of stars, right? These aren't physical. This is just an artifact of the model assumptions that all the energy gets dumped into a planet's atmosphere. So obviously these outflows can have a really significant effect on the temperature of a planet's atmosphere. And when you think about temperature, your mind probably does immediately go to, you know, the temperature that you would need to sustain life. And if things then did end up, you know, increasing by a thousand degrees, then that exactly wouldn't be something that we could adjust to. But the other problem with increasing the temperature of a planet's atmosphere is that, you know, the molecules in the atmosphere then have more energy. And so they're moving at a faster speed. And if you increase them enough, then their speed can actually exceed what's called the escape velocity of a planet, you know, the velocity, the, the speed that you would have to be going at to escape the pull 
of the gravity of that planet. So an outflow could actually cause a planet to lose some of its atmosphere. So this graph actually shows the mass in an atmosphere that will be lost as a fraction of Earth's atmosphere's mass with distance, again, from the galaxy center where the outflow is coming from. Again, where Earth is, our eight kiloparsec, we've probably got nothing to worry about. We lose anywhere from 0.01 to 0.1% of our atmosphere. But really close in, there's a potential for an entire atmosphere to be lost. So the impact of an outflow could be catastrophic. Not only that, though, this paper also looks at whether an outflow from a growing supermassive black hole could impact the ozone layer on a planet as well. So the Earth's ozone layer, ozone being O3, so three atoms of oxygen bound together as opposed to like a normal oxygen that we breathe in the air, which is O2. Ozone actually protects us from incredibly harmful radiation, like x-rays, for example, and it stops that from, you know, reaching the ground so that life can flourish. I actually talked about this a lot in my video reacting to the film Fish where that was actually like a, a main storyline of the film that that had happened during like a solar flare from the sun. So here they looked at the time that an outflow would have to be active for in order to deplete an, the ozone layer by like 90%. So in this paper, they found that at the distance of the solar system, again, at eight kiloparsec, an outflow only has to be active for between 100 to 10,000 years to get rid of 90% of the ozone layer in an Earth-like planet which is actually pretty plausible. In my own research, I found that outflows from growing supermassive black holes in the galaxies that I were looking at an average a lifetime of around about a million years or so. But thankfully, a little quirk of chemistry comes in to save the day because as you deplete the ozone, as you break it up into its individual uh, oxygen atoms that can then bind with nitrogen, it makes nitric oxide. But then that only has like a lifetime of around about four years or so in the atmosphere before again, that breaks up into a nitrogen and oxygen atom and then that oxygen atom can then bind with an O2 molecule and make O3 again. And so what would actually happen over that much longer timescale of being like 100 to 10,000 years of an outflow being active is you probably end up with this like happy medium, this balance being found of like depletion and, and reformation every four years or so. But planets around stars much closer into the center, the depletion happens in less than four years. And so those atmospheres would lose all their ozone very quickly. So you'd have nothing protecting that planet from dangerous levels of high energy radiation like x-rays, which we know are also coming from that disk of material spanning around the black hole as well, that it's also very close to because it's close into the center. So you can imagine that uh, that scenario would be absolutely catastrophic for a planet close in that was hosting life. So the conclusions of this paper are essentially that if there's a planet in the inner kiloparsec of a galaxy and its supermassive black hole starts growing, gives off an outflow, it is definitely in the danger zone. And if it's in the inner 0.2 kiloparsec, it's probably completely <laughs> screwed. Although Ambrifian collaborators point out that the scenario of a planet losing its atmosphere, so sort of like energy being dumped in the atmosphere, which heats it, which causes the molecules to speed up so that they have enough energy to escape the pull of that planet's gravity, that might not actually be a negative scenario when it comes to sort of the development of life. Because if you think about a gas giant like Neptune, right, which has this really thick hydrogen atmosphere around like what is essentially like a, an iron core in the center, a rocky core, then if you had all of its atmosphere stripped by an outflow from a growing supermassive black hole, then you could end up with something that just looks like a rocky planet, like Earth or Mars, right? That could over time collect a thinner atmosphere again, and then maybe even be somewhere that could host life, whereas it couldn't do before when it was this sort of big gas giant. So it's really interesting to think about the impact of these outflows from growing supermassive black holes in the sense of galactic habitability rather than like, you know, impact on the star formation rate of a galaxy like I think about every day. Now, I don't think we have anything to worry about with the Milky Way's supermassive black hole. It is not currently growing. It does not have one of these gas disks around it that would lead to this radiation pressure that could cause an outflow. Milky Way's black hole is uncharacteristically small and uncharacteristically quiet as well, which to be honest, could explain why we are all even here in the first place. 
That's not to say it might not have been active or growing a few billion years in the past though, like the Fermi bubbles could be echoes of a past outflow from the Milky Way. So what you'd really want to do, like what would be really cool to do in like an ideal situation here is you'd be able to find planets that had maybe been affected by the past growth of the Milky Way's supermassive black hole, you know, looking for those signatures of, you know, an atmosphere that has an incredibly high temperature that can't be explained anyway, or perhaps, you know, like the velocities of the molecules in the atmosphere you can tell they're much higher than they should be. Things like that. You look for stuff like that in the atmospheres of any planets you found in those inner regions. But as Unbreaking Carburetes has pointed out, they would be in those inner regions, at least within like a kiloparsec of the, of the center of the Milky Way, if not like, you know, 0.2 kiloparsecs of the center of the Milky Way, which is going to be at least like seven kiloparsecs away from where the Earth is on the edges of the Milky Way, which is roughly around about 22,000 light years away, which is far too far for any telescope that we have to actually be able to pick up the actual signatures of molecules moving in atmospheres of planets. It saddens me to say, but even the James Webb Space Telescope won't be able to do this. <sighs> Before we get to the bloopers, a huge thank you to this week's video sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is an interactive learning platform for courses across science, maths, and computer science that really lets you get to grips with the concept by learning by doing. That's the way I personally learn best. Because my favorite thing about Brilliant's courses really is that interactivity. It gives you a much deeper understanding of a topic. Now, one thing I hear a lot from aspiring astrophysicists is that they struggle with the maths or they lack confidence with maths. And my advice is always the same practice. Practice it like a language until it becomes second nature. So I particularly like Brilliant's new everyday maths course that reinforces the basics of like fractions or ratios in everyday concepts that are familiar so that they're then not as foreign in a less everyday concept like outflows from growing supermassive black holes. So if that sounds like something you'd be up for and you want to get started for free, head to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky, or you can click on the link in the video description below. And the first 200 people are going to get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So thanks again to Brilliant. And now roll those bloopers. And to understand the, understand, <laughs> I'm going to go get my track to, to Bristol and understand some science. Do you have that perfect Goldilocks temperature that like, Light can survive at, but not life can survive at. God, just sat on the arm of the chair. Ow. I think I'm okay. <laughs> For a minute there, I lost my atmosphere. I lost my sphere. 